to our historical presentation that we scheduled for today, Perspectives on the History of LGBTQ Rights in the United States. I want to thank Commissioner Yaki, who is on the telephone, for suggesting this month's speaker topic. And uh, also, I welcome each of our speakers. So you know, June is commonly celebrated as Pride Month, and today's Pride celebrations stem from a DC resident, Frank Kameny, who organized what he called an annual reminder demonstration in Philadelphia around the 4th of July. Yale history professor George Chauncey has said that, quote, the annual reminder was meant to remind the nation on its birthday of the promise of rights, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that had been denied to gay people. We've come a long way from 1964, when Mr. Kennedy first organized his annual remembrances, and I look forward to hearing from our speakers about what that progress has looked like as a nation in that time. Uh, today's topic informs and permeates all of the work that we in the Commission currently investigate because LGBT Americans participate in all of our social institutions. Just today, we voted to investigate hate crimes as a topic in the coming year, and we know painfully that the LGBT community is and has been targets of hate incidents in this nation. Last month, during our briefing about the collateral consequences of incarceration, we heard testimony and received information about the experiences of LGBT persons in prison and through reentry into the non-incarcerated community. The Commission is currently working on a report about employment and employment discrimination experiences of LGBT workers. And a majority of the Commission has voted to recognize that sex discrimination necessarily includes gender identity discrimination for purposes of compliance with Title IX, and to condemn state laws and proposals targeting members of the LGBT community for discrimination. These are a fraction of so many ways our LGBT community members live and have lived civil rights struggles in this country. For this and all social movements, we must know our past so we can know our future. And I am so deeply grateful to our speakers today for helping to guide us. Our first speaker, Ray Carey, has served as the National LGBTQ Task Force Executive Director since 2008 and has advanced a vision of freedom for LGBTQ people and their families that is broad, inclusive, and progressive, grounding her work solidly in racial, economic, and social justice. Ms. Carey counts among her many successes, winning an LGBT inclusive federal hate crimes prevention law, defeating multiple state anti-LGBT ballot measures, spotlighting discrimination against transgender people, winning marriage equality, and securing scores of changes in federal agencies to attend to the needs of the LGBT community. Our second speaker, Eliza Byard, is the executive director of the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network, also known as GLSEN. She has led GLSEN for 16 years, first as deputy executive director and now as executive director. In her tenure, GLSEN has developed winning national and international campaigns, securing core rights protections for LGBT students and young people, created teaching guides and in-school programming to prevent bullying and harassment and support student learning success, and trained and supported youth advocates and leaders. And our third speaker, Mark Kiesling, is the executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality, the nation's leading social justice advocacy organization for transgender people. Since founding NCTE in 2003, Mara has led organizational and coalition efforts that have won significant advances in transgender equality. As one of the nation's leading voices for transgender equality, Mara is regularly quoted in national and local print media, and now here at the commission. Ms. Carey, you will hear from you first. Thank you so much. Oh, press my button. Thank you so much, Chair Lehman, and thank you, commissioners, for inviting us in this particular month, uh, Pride Month, that holds special meeting, as you notice, as you noted, and I brought a picture of Frank with me, not knowing what your <laughs> opening comments will be, because he is key to our history and to our movement, not just here in DC, but nationally. Um, I carry this with me often when I go to uh, events, particularly in the government, um, and in a minute I'll talk about why <laughs> to when I go to government agencies. Um, thank you so much for inviting us here. And, uh, we were asked to talk a little bit, actually, about our personal uh, stories and journeys with regard to working in the movement, how we got here. Um, so I'll be doing a little bit of that and then some historical context. And then my friends here will pick up uh, the rest of it. So um, I, in terms of my own personal experience, uh, I came out as a 16-year-old in Denver, Colorado in the mid-80s in the midst of the AIDS crisis when it was just starting. In fact, my uncle's partner died of GRID, 
gay-related immune defici deficiency syndrome. And that really was formative in terms of my advocacy uh, really up until now. I'm 50 years old now, so I've spent really my entire career in one way or another uh, working on LGBT issues and in the movement. Um, it's at that time, uh, you know, my story and the story of the movement um, parallel each other in that we have had different phases in our movement of development. Different issues have come to the fore, uh, whether it's public policy or what's facing our community, and I've had the, the honor of being a part of that. And I guess one thing I want to say um, about coming out as a teenager in the 80s was I thought I was exempt from getting married and having kids. <laughs> I thought that's not what happens to lesbians, right? Little did I know that in fact what I was doing was making sense for myself about things that were not accessible to me or expected of me. Uh, I'm now married and have a daughter. <laughs> so, um, But my journey through this, um, again briefly, is uh, because at the time when I came out, my friends were getting sick and dying, I immediately turned to HIV and AIDS work and activism. And here in Washington, uh, that took two, uh, it kind of manifested in two ways. I was one of the first advocates and lobbyists on HIV prevention, particularly for high risk and runaway youth. And I was also an ACT UP, and many of us were at the time. And that experience, and I think for our movement, has formed uh, for a lot of us an understanding that there is no one way to achieve civil rights. There is no one avenue, one tactic, one strategy that we really have to work in many ways through legal avenues, lobbying, advocacy, and activism. Um, and I spent a particular amount of time uh, partnering with others to create organizations attending to the needs of our community, including youth service organizations, anti-violence projects, um, and community-based services, uh, particularly around HIV and AIDS. I, I want to move to the history of the movement. I know we have a little uh, limited time, uh, and I'm happy later to talk and answer other questions. But the history of our movement really has been about resilience. Um, I won't go back hundreds of years <laughs> for our movement. I'll just mostly talk about what's considered to be the modern LGBTQ movement. Most people uh, frame that time as starting with the Stonewall Riots in New York City in 1969. There were some significant things that happened before then that are, in fact, a through line to your work and to our work in terms of progress or challenges that our community has faced over the years. Very early on, uh, in the 20s and 30s, 40s, 50s, groups of what would have been identified at that time as gay and lesbian people formed social clubs, had to have secret meetings in order to share their stories with each other. Um, we had a couple of organizations that were instrumental uh, to our community gathering together. One was the Mattachine Society, which was founded by Harry Hay and Frank Hamley, actually. Um, we also, uh, in, and I'm going to give you a few markers, there are many, but I'm just going to give you a few because there's a through line to some of the progress that we've made as a community. Um, there's also the Daughters of Belitis, which was the lesbian-focused uh, organization. In 1952, the American Psychiatric Association included in its diagnostic manual homosexuality as a sociopathic personality disturbance. And we spent 20 years before that was removed as a mental illness. In 1973, when my organization was founded as the National Gay Task Force, our first order of business was to destigmatize de that homosexuality, destigmatize de being gay, lesbian, bisexual, and we were successful in removing that from the DSM. That was a major marker in our movement's history and has helped us build on legal cases, on research, both physical and mental health over the years, um, ever since that time. In 1957, this is another through line here, in 1957, Frank Kameny was kicked out of the federal government. He was a public service he, servant. He was an astronomer uh, with the US Army and was kicked out of federal government. 
it wasn't until a few years ago with the Obama administration that the federal government formally apologized to him for doing so. And that was a momentous occasion after all Frank had done for our movement to be recognized as the leader that he is and that he should not have been kicked out of the government along, that, along with others. The, the relationship between our community and the federal government, there are many, many markers, but the first ever meeting of what were then gay, out gay and lesbian people uh, was in 1977 with the Carter administration. And that was the first time at the White House with the federal government there had been an open conversation about the needs of our community. We have had hundreds of meetings ever since then. <laughs> Frank was part of that meeting as well. Um, and much progress has been made uh, through the agencies uh, in, in a number of administrations. When I was first doing HIV and youth services, we made significant progress with the first Bush administration in making sure that we could start getting uh, data to prove that we existed. Um, excuse me. Just a couple of other things about um, our history and kind of where we are now and moving forward, and, and then I'll uh, turn this off to my colleagues. I mentioned earlier our history is one of, of resilience. That's both personal, but it's also structural in a way. That we have had to build from the ground up, from zero, institutions that serve our communities. In the 70s, uh, a lot of that uh, a lot of those organizations were social groups or community organizations, many of which turned into what are today our LGBT community service centers. In the 90s, we spent a lot of time building up anti-violence projects around the country and the youth service infrastructure, including LGBTQ specific youth services because they couldn't turn anywhere else for services. And certainly notably, we built uh, an entire aid service structure. Uh, with one of the most significant health crises uh, in, our, in our nations and in this world's history, the community came together and built our own institutions. Over time, we have been very um, uh, methodical about gathering data, partnering with federal agencies to gather data, to continue to build those services, and over time, the government has funded a number of those services. But early on in any of those infrastructures, we were self-funded and self-created. In terms of looking forward and, and kind of the trajectory of our movement, where we are now in some ways harkens back to the Stonewall riots. What happened that night at Stonewall is a lot of young people, a lot of people of color, a lot of what uh, would be considered transgender or gender non-conforming people, and a lot of drag queens got fed up they got fed up of being raided by the police again and again. And they said, stop. And our movement now, when we look at the work to be done, more than ever, I think, is cross-movement with other movements. We are a movement now with an eye towards racial justice, economic justice. Some of the same people who are homeless but, uh, and, and who were at Stonewall that night would be central to the work that we are doing right now where they are alive. I, we have seen a lot of hope in our, in our work over the last number of years as we have partnered with other movements, including the immigrant rights movement, the reproductive rights movement, Muslim organizations, women's organizations. And that, when we look forward, I think is really the next phase of uh, how we'll be working on civil rights together. We have been doing that, but I think many more organizations are going to get involved in working across movements in, in addressing civil rights issues, but also recognizing that um, each of us carry many identities. You can't be a bisexual woman one day, a Latina the next, and a mom the third day. You are all of those every single day. And as a movement and as a country, we have to attend to people as whole people. Thank you. Thanks very much. Inspired? Well, first of all, thank you again, Chair Lehman and members of the Commission. It means a great deal to be here today. Um, it is particularly moving to be here uh, at what I believe, at least as far as I'm aware, is the only um, federal agency um, commemoration of the fact that this is Pride Month this year, um, an event that uh, 
means a great deal uh, to those of us who have spent years in a community that has largely built itself a separate infrastructure while trying to ensure its inclusion in other institutions. I'm going to shift my attention a bit to a more recent um, arc of the history of the LGBT movement and focus a bit on the human cost behind the urgency that has driven us for so many generations to create institutions, organizations, and uh, manifestations of our resilience. To do that, a bit of a personal reflection first. In June of 2009, I attended an official event at the White House for the very first time in my own life. It was a reception to celebrate LGBT pride held by President Obama at the very outset of his first term. And walking through the door of the White House and being welcomed by the Marines who stood there, I cried. I come before you today as an advocate for LGBT youth and educational equity, a one-time US history professor, and a lesbian whose life has been shaped by my relationship to the law and to the civil rights pioneers and heroes to whom I owe so very much. And that day at the White House for me represented a communion with this country's promise of equality beyond anything I had ever dared to dream of myself. I was accompanied that day by Conrad Honecker, a gay high school student from Tennessee and his parents. And as I watched Conrad looking around at the inside of the White House in absolute awe, and disbelief. I thought back to June of 1986 when I myself graduated from high school. And that Pride Month, I mostly at that point closeted, to the rest of the world at least, got a very different in, uh, message from my government about my relationship to these United States of America as the Supreme Court issued its decision in Bowers versus Hardwick. As I got ready to leave the safety of my parents' home, I was not out to them, so my home was still safe for me, Justice Byron White said that any arguments that LGBT people were not criminals by reason of a fundamental right to privacy were facetious. You can imagine how that landed on the ears of a 17-year-old trying to make sense of her place in the world. My right to exist was outweighed by, by an amorphous body of information that Justice White referred to as simply millennia of moral teaching. That decision remained the guiding law of the land until 2003, only 14 years ago, at which time Justice Anthony Kennedy finally said in Lawrence versus Texas, the state cannot demean the very existence of LGBT people or control their destiny by making their private conduct a crime. Those words finally ended a regime which simply made me a criminal and all the rest of my peers within the community. What is amazing to see is how much we have, how far we have come, even just since Lawrence. Lawrence itself was only five short years before I stepped across the threshold and was welcomed at the White House. And in the eight years of the Obama administration, with engagement from the civil rights enforcement infrastructure of the federal government, we have begun to make real progress. LGBT students today, students like Conrad, just two high school generations later, have begun to get a glimpse in a world in which their lives are valued, not demeaned. And we have just begun to chip away at the psychic and physical violence that makes our country's promises of liberty and equality seem for LGBT youth either a cruel joke or a distant dream. And as we sit here today, aspects of that are being called into question. Some in government at the state 
at federal level seek to carve out reasons to allow continued discrimination against LGBT people and to specifically undermine some of the civil rights progress that has meant so much to so many millions of Americans over the past decade. So today, I want to be really clear about the current human cost of the discrimination that we seek to end um, and that our civil rights promises give us a hope of addressing. In my professional life at GLSEN, we measure our success in terms of the health and well-being of LGBT youth and the opportunity they have to live up to their potential. Um, so let's think about who we're thinking about here. In the most recent Youth Risk Behavior Survey, the CDC's national sort of dashboard for uh, youth health and well-being in this country, um, the national survey asked about sexual orientation for the first time. And more than 11% of US students who answered the survey uh, identified as lesbian, gay, or not sure. Estimates of transgender students currently in the United States range from about 125,000 to 200,000 students. So this translates to more than 6.1 million students in this country who are directly affected by these issues and by what their government is telling them about who they are and what their rights are every day. Um, let's also remember that LGBT people are drawn from every single community um, which this commission is uh, empowered to protect and represent uh, people who live in all of their identities every day. Uh, they cannot be separated out from their race, their religion, their, uh, whether or not they have a disability uh, or their immigration status. And what they experience every day remains very troubling. More than 85% of LGBT youth experience routine harassment at school. I wager that most people in this room, most of us, thankfully, are in a position where we do not have to leave our homes in the morning expecting to face violence during the course of the day. 85% of LGBT youth simply going to school have to expect that at some point during that day they will experience some form of harassment as part of their daily routine. 56% of LGBT youth in this country have also experienced direct discrimination on the part of the institutions that they attend. Whether that is, those things range from not being allowed to write a paper on the topic of your choice, students have been prohibited from writing about the Stonewall riots and other landmarks in LGBT history as part of their high school education. It might be uh, being prohibited from attending the prom uh, with the person of your choice. It might be about uh, putting a sign up in the hallway on the same basis as other students in the school. And in some cases, students report they have actually been disciplined for being LGBT itself. These students are also much more likely to experience school discipline than their peers. Um, a disparity which rises when you're talking about LGBT students who are uh, students of color or have disabilities or who are transgender or gender non-conforming. So clearly, uh, and, I, and I have to tell you, uh, in the midst of this, that 85% is a dramatic improvement from where those numbers were when I started working with Glisten in 2001. In 2001, more than 90% of LGBT youth were experiencing this kind of harassment every single day. Um, <coughs> So we have a body of students who are experiencing um, things we wouldn't wish on anyone as part of their uh, life in school. And the consequences of that experience are concrete and dramatic. There are consequences for their educational aspiration, aspirations and life outcomes. For those who are victimized at a high rate, they are more than twice as likely as their peers, for example, to say they don't plan to graduate and go on to college. Their GPAs are lower. Um, in that same YRBS, where they finally were able to actually identify and document the existence of all these students across the country, this dashboard of youth well-being in America demonstrated that in every single one of the categories of risk behavior and diminished health outcomes that the CDC chooses to track, these students do more poorly, do worse 
than their heterosexual or gender conforming or cisgender peers, every single one. There is some good news here, uh, particularly in our recent history. When discrimination against LGBT students is directly addressed, and when this violence is reduced, students' lives improve. This is both in terms of the ways that, a, that reducing bias and violence can improve an individual life right away, and in terms of how systemic approaches to reducing discrimination in our society actually have a concrete impact on the health, well-being, and uh, life chances of individual Americans. For example, from 1999 to, uh, to 2015, LGBT people in this country repeatedly experienced their states debating and, in many cases, passing uh, constitutional amendments that abrogated and limited their civil rights with respect to marriage. A long-term study of the health effects of living in that context demonstrated that when states did not pass those measures, in those states that rejected efforts to, to uh, ban marriage equality, and in those states where marriage equality eventually was passed, there was a 14% reduction in suicide rates among LGBT youth in those states. There was a concrete correlation between your understanding of your relationship to your community, your state, and your government, and your willingness to live. That's translated for adults as well. Another study found that rates of suicide, anxiety, and depression among LGBT adults in those states that had those debates was concretely correlated with the outcomes of these civil rights debates across our country. More specifically, in schools, we found that in those places where we address the discrimination in schools, where measures are put in place to improve LGBT student experience, you see improvement. We know what works. And with partnership with federal and state and local agencies to actually affect civil rights progress for all students, we have seen a 13% reduction across the country since 2005 in rates of bullying, harassment, and violence that students face every day. What that translates into is 7 million students who are not experiencing or witnessing this routine violence. 7 million fewer students actually having this as part of their everyday experience uh, in school. So here we are today. As LGBT people, we are no longer criminals. We are no longer classified as ill. And yet, there are some in our governments at the local, state, and federal level who seek to carve out new reasons to allow discrimination against us to continue. This flies in the face of all of the evidence we have of what makes sense for our communities, what makes sense for our future. Indeed, as the Seventh Circuit Court recently said in upholding the right of a student named Ashton Whitaker to use the correct bathroom, that when the school district came forward to say, no, actually, we need to discriminate against the student, the court responded, the harms identified by the school district in this case are all speculative and based upon conjecture. Whereas the harms to Ash, the harms to the student, are well documented and supported by the record. In the larger picture, and in the arc of our history right now, with respect to civil rights and justice in this country, the harms of discrimination against the LGBT community are well documented and supported by the record. The benefits of addressing that discrimination and alleviating the burden of prejudice, fear, and violence are very, very clear. And the question remains, why won't we simply continue? I hope that we will. And to think about all the ways that we can, I will turn it over to my colleague, Mark Easley. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eliza and Ray. Thank you, commissioners, Chair Lehman. I really appreciate being here. Uh, my name is Mara Kiesling. I'm 57 years old, and I represent the roughly 2 million um, transgender people in the United States. Uh, before I start, I want to um, 
just take a moment of privilege and recognize that today is the 159th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln accepting the nomination to be a U.S. Senator from Illinois. And at the Republican convention where he got that, he made his famous speech where he noted, and I think it is worth listening to today, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. It's something we should think about more often in general, and thought I would take the opportunity to remind us of that now. Um, I, I want to start in 2001 um, in Pennsylvania that the what was becoming the LGBT community was trying to pass a hate crimes bill, uh, and it would add sexual orientation as a category, and we wanted to add gender identity into it. So we went to see the um, Senate Minority Leader this particular day. This was, uh, and, and it's important to the story, this was a liberal Democrat. And we said we want a gender identity in the bill. He said no. Then he pulled me aside as the only trans person in the delegation, and he said, but Mara, look at the bright side. Two years ago, I would not have let you in my office. It was roughly 15 years ago, six, so 16 years ago. Um, since then, I've also been in the White House. Um, um, last week, Ray and I were meeting with 16 United States senators. Um, things have changed very dramatically in the last 15 years, and I want to note that. Uh, last year, I was speaking at the University of Chicago Institute of Politics, and when some of the students found out that I had attended the University of Chicago, when it was question time, they said, um, how was the administration on transgender issues when you were there? And I said, I was there in 1979. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, well, how was the administration? And I said, there weren't transgender students. And they were like, well, you were there. And I'm like, whoa, no. <laughs> if you had called me out as a transgender student, I would have denied it at the time. It was not a possibility. It wasn't even that I was in the closet. It was not a possibility. There were not out trans people. Of course, there were some. But, but most of us could not even imagine it would be possible to come out. Um, things have changed so much. I was in a school in uh, Mount Vernon, Virginia last week, uh, a secondary school that has nine out transgender students in it. Transgender students are now in virtually every school in the country, certainly in every school district. There are some school districts where they may not feel they are safe to come out, but they are there, and they are um, beginning to come out even in those schools. Um, I want to back up about 10 years to when the Americans with Disability Act was passed um, in, uh, around uh, 1980, went, joined the debates in 1989 and 1990. There was no trans voice in Washington. There were no trans voices in public policy in the United States. And so the Americans with Disabilities Act passed with what can only nicely be called disrespectful language about transgender people, um, but was really dismissive, dangerous, and um, uh, uh, insulting. Um, there was nobody to speak for trans people. As the century ended, we started coming out. We started learning about ourselves on the internet and learning about each other and building community. Um, and started understanding why it was we were discriminated against. And one of the things we came to understand, um, uh, kind of conceptually, is that if I'm facing discrimination in employment, education, housing, healthcare, or anything else, it is because of my gender or because of my sex. Um, using those interchangeably as a non-attorney, uh, I, I will do that, and for our purposes, they, they really are interchangeable. But what we understood was the discriminating, if you discriminate against me in employment, it's because I am a woman or I'm not a woman, or you think I'm not a woman, or you think I'm not enough of a woman. It is clearly about sex. And that was a hard thing to sell at first, because people had this idea in their head that they had for centuries, and um, it is now pretty clearly understood. As, as one um, um, a conservative attorney told me the other day, in courts it is now virtually a foregone conclusion um, that sex discrimination protects transgender people. That has been um, a, an amazing way that we've progressed, but the truth is while that's happening every single day in the United States, there are thousands of tragedies happening to really good people. Just two days ago in Ithaca, New York, Josie Barrios was murdered. She was the 14th transgender woman of color this year murdered in the United States. Um, she was murdered and then burned beyond recognition. Um, 
Uh, that is also a, a common anti-trans bias uh, MO. Um, what we have learned in the last 15 years as we've been doing these work, this work as a trans movement, a transgender movement, as an LGBT movement, is that we have to talk about it. For the longest time, we as a community were afraid to talk about marriage. If we said what we wanted was marriage, people wouldn't like us. As soon as we started talking about marriage, we started winning marriage equality. We were terrified in the 80s and 90s to talk about queer children, to say that there were gay children and transgender children. We were just afraid to do it because our enemies would attack us. They would call us predators. They would call us recruiters. They would call us horrible things. When groups like GLSEN started talking about protecting our children, we started protecting our children. Transgender people are now at the place where we are talking about bathrooms. We didn't want to talk about bathrooms. Um, we still don't really want to talk about bathrooms. Um, I have a friend who's trying to start a campaign called Get Your Head Out of the Toilet um, to get people to stop talking about bathrooms. But here's the truth. We are talking, we are having a, a national conversation about this, and we will come out on the other side stronger. We will come out on the other side with people understanding. If the kids Eliza was talking about, like Ash Whitaker, cannot use the correct bathroom at school, they cannot be students. If somebody who works here at the commission cannot use the right bathroom, they can't have a job. They just can't work here. This is not about uh, I, I read it again this morning in the Los Angeles Times when they were talking about another rollback at the U.S. Department of Education, OCR, where they said, they, they talked about children using the bathroom of their choice. It is not about that. Trans people will tell you it is not about that. There is no choice. Um, if there's a choice, it's do I go in this one and get arrested or do I get in this one and get beat up? There is not a choice. You know which one you have to go to if you're trans, and, and we have to sort of recognize that. The bathroom conversation um, also leads me to one other thing I just want to tell you about that happened to me last year. Um, we were deeply involved.